one way to uh, talk about the practice of meditation and what it is that these teachings have to offer us could be reflected in a famous Zen story about a guy that was being chased by a tiger. And uh, he gets to a cliff. He's running away from the tiger and he gets to a cliff. There's nowhere to go. So he climbs down uh, over the edge of the cliff. He climbs down because he saw that there was a tree growing out of the rocks, some, or a bush or a tree growing out of the rocks. So he, he slid down and held on to the tree below the cliff. And the tiger came and was trying to get him and, you know, and, and uh, then he noticed because of his weight that the, this bush that he was hanging from started to come loose from the rocks. And he looked down and he realized it was far enough that he was going to die. So as he looks up and he sees this bush roots coming out of the rocks and there's a few seconds before he's going to fall, he notices there's berries on the bush. He grabs the berries and stuffs them in his mouth and then falls to his death. So this, this story is meant to point to something that uh, these teachings are pointing to. And it's pointing to the fact that you could say a human life is just like that. There's no escape. Hmm? The, uh, the, the time is chasing you, just like the lion's chasing you. Time is chasing you, you know? And there's, nowhere, there's no way out. There's nowhere to go. Death is imminent, right? The question is, uh, as you live your life, even though the, the end is guaranteed, the end is known, um, are you able to, to be aware of who you actually are in such a way that you uh, take advantage of the opportunities that, to, uh, that present themselves in your life, like the, the berries on the bush? Are you awake enough to notice the berries in your life? Are you awake enough to notice uh, what's available to you that you can enjoy and experience in this brief time that you're in the world? And uh, for most human beings, that's not the case. For most human beings, that not, that's not the case. If you think about it, for most human beings, uh, they would be so terrified, right, and so totally um, um, in that state of fear that it wouldn't even occur to them to take the berries, that that wouldn't even show up. It would, they, they would be totally consumed with fear and totally consumed with the circumstances that exist. One of my Zen teachers, one of the things he's been saying these days is, don't let the circumstances determine your experience. That's another way of talking about that, that story. You know, don't let the circumstances determine your experience. If you're going to die tomorrow, uh, are you awake enough and are you clear enough about the truth to be able to live today? If you're going to die tomorrow, are you clear enough about reality and about your true nature uh, to be able to live today in spite of the fact that you're going to die tomorrow? Most of us are living a very fragile existence and not much has to go wrong before you're freaked out and you can't function, you know? If you lose somebody you're close to, if you get a terminal diagnosis, um, if you lose a lot of money, if your house burns down, you know, my, my Zen teacher, his house burned down and uh, his wife was away, and he had been out that night, and he came home and noticed when he drove into the driveway, he noticed his house was on fire, like really on fire. So he drove up to near the house, and the fire company came, and the fireman came over to him and said, is this your house? And he said, yes. And he said, is there anybody in there? And he said, no. 
And he said, well, it's too far gone. We're just going to have to let it burn. So he said, oh, okay. And then a news person was there from the local news. So they came over to him and said, is this your house? And he said, yeah. And you know how they are with the news, right? Well, what's it like to stand here and watch your house burn down, sir? And he just turned to them and said, uh, excuse me, do you have any popcorn? That's actually what he said. See, if you can be that way in, in relationship to the circumstances you have, then you truly, you've truly experienced what it means to be transcendent, to be transcendent. Meaning that, yeah, I, meaning that, yeah, the, I am here in the space-time continuum, but I've done the practice and I've studied the teaching sufficiently enough to experience my true nature under all circumstances. And because that's the case, although I am in this world, I am not of this world. Although that's the case, although my house is burning down, I am experiencing living a human life that includes things like houses burning down. And my happiness is a function of the fact that I exist, not what circumstances are there. It's a function of the fact that I'm here. I'm so happy to be here, I don't mind the circumstances. I'm so happy to be here because I have had the benefit of the Dharma, I have the benefit of the teaching, which tells me who I am, which allows me to discover who I am as an experience, a direct experience of my true nature. And because that's the case, I'm free. Free, free, from, free for what? Free to be here and not be run by fear. Free to be here and not be run by anger. Free to be here and not be run by circumstances. So I can enjoy life. I can, and the only way you can enjoy life is to enjoy all of life. You can't say, well, I'm enjoying my life except for when it's raining or except for when my, child, my children are acting out, except for when my partner's uh, inconsiderate, except for when I have a headache, you know, except for when the stock market goes down. You see, that, you know, when you, talk, when you ask anybody, how are you, they're going to tell you circumstances, aren't they? Yeah. And most people want to look good, so they'll tell you good, good things. You know, oh, I'm wonderful, you know, I'm wonderful, you know, just came back from Europe, you know, blah, 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 blah. They're not telling you that they're miserable. <laughs> they're telling you what would allow you to see them in a positive light, right? And then they have to, and then, and then this is the human condition. And then the person has to keep it secret that actually I'm miserable. And, uh, but I don't want anybody to know that because then they'll think bad of me or they'll think less of me. So I have to maintain a pretense, right? Most human beings are maintaining a pretense, you know? They're pretending that everything's okay. When if they were really going to be brutally honest and really share what it's like to be them living their life, it wouldn't, it wouldn't come out like that. It would be that they're suffering, that they're miserable. And most human beings are in denial about their misery, right? So they're in denial about it. They don't, they don't want to think about it, you know? They act as if they can escape by pretending it's not true. But it will have its way. It will have its way because the nervous system doesn't lie. The body doesn't lie. So you, you, could, t you could tell yourself lies. You could pretend that everything is okay. In the meantime, because the body doesn't lie, you know, you're starting to experience disease. Right? This, is, this is so common among human beings, right? I mean, you know, look at the statistical reality of it in terms of how the diseases that are a function of stress, that are, that are related to stress, how those, those conditions are going up big time, you know? People are dying younger. People are going crazier, you know? Drug use is off the charts. People are risking their life to get high, aren't they? You know, fentanyl's killing all kinds of people these days. Young people who are unstable and uh, are, are not able to deal with life because of their conditioning, because they have been raised in such a way to avoid discomfort at all costs. That's the, uh, that's the way the conditioning that we expose our children to, avoid, uh, avoid discomfort at all costs. 
So that means if you're, uh, if you're a teenager and you're uncomfortable and you've been conditioned to avoid discomfort at all costs from television ads, from the way your parents behave, so as soon as you're uncomfortable, you look for relief. And relief is immediately available today, more than it ever was, you know. In schools, you know, I'm a psychologist, and one of the things that's evident to me, you know, I've been practicing 50 years, right? And these days, when I meet with people in my office, right, I almost hardly ever meet anybody that doesn't tell me that they're uh, using drugs, prescription and street drugs, that they're using drugs. Almost everybody I work with is uh, uh, smoking marijuana, taking uh, hallucinogens. Uh, these things are popular now. It's a fad, you know, uh, mushrooms, you know, I mean, psilocybin, you know. And now it's on Facebook and in the news that psychedelics are going to be approved by the uh, Food and Drug Administration, you know, to be used by psychologists and psychiatrists and treating people, you know, to help them come out of the condition of depression or help them to relax. So it's becoming more and more popular and more and more accessible and more and more available to have access to things that will allow you to change your experience. So it becomes, it becomes even more unacceptable to be uncomfortable because why should you be uncomfortable? So this, this, is, the, this is the circumstances that we have these days in the world, in the collective reality that we're living in. So you really have to look for yourself and see, you know, where do I stand in regard to this? You know, where do I stand in regard to this? If it's possible to wake up, as the teachings tell us, if it's possible to experience that just being alive is enough, you know, just ex existing is enough, like they say in the Advaita Vedanta teachings, in that famous one-liner that they always quote, Sat Chit Ananda, Sat Chit Ananda. What are they saying? Sat Chit Ananda. Sat is existence, Chit is consciousness, Ananda is happiness. Mm. I exist, I recognize myself as consciousness, and I am happy. That's the whole teaching, the Advaita Vedanta teaching, Sat Chit Ananda. So the question is, is that saying that 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 Sat Chit Ananda is available for me, available for everybody, yeah, that I can wake up and experience my existence to be the fulfillment of my life. I can wake up and experience my existence to be the fulfillment of my life, meaning that the fact that I exist is what I'm happy about, and I don't mind anything else that's happening in my life. I don't mind the circumstances. And part of not minding the circumstances is to understand the truth you know, to recognize life. You know, what does it mean to recognize life? It means to recognize that life is obviously the way it is, is it not? Life is obviously the way it is, right? What's that mean? It's constantly changing, right? It's constantly changing, it's unpredictable, it's unpredictable. Sometimes it feels good, sometimes it feels bad. Sometimes you're confused, sometimes you're, you're clear, right? Sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're sad. The circumstances are unpredictable. Your house could burn down anytime, you know. You could be in a car accident anytime. You could get terminal cancer anytime. So that's life. So in the face of that, you know, in the face of that, most people are doing their best to not think about reality, to not think about the possibilities, right? To stay involved in some kind of mental process that is a pretense, that stay involved in some kind of mental process that's uh, denying and avoiding and resisting that information. You know, keeping that information out of my awareness. Don't talk about death, even to somebody that's dying. What a disservice that we do to each other. You know, somebody that's dying, uh, we come up with the idea that it's a good idea not to talk about death with them because they're dying. Well, who are we protecting, them or us? You know, we don't want to talk about death, you know. We're not doing them a big favor. You know, most people that are dying have a sense that that's the case. So now they have to deal with the fact that you don't want to talk about it with them. <laughs> it's a lonely death like that, right? 
yeah, if somebody's dying, you know, the gift that you can give them is to help them relax. Help them relax. Death is not, uh, str death is not something that's odd or uh, death is not something that is um, unusual, you know. We, we relate to it like it's unusual. No, it's just as common as birth. It's just as natural as birth. What comes has to go. What's born has to die. So this is life. Life is an ever-changing reality. In the Buddhist teachings, they call it impermanence. Impermanence. Every everything is changing. You can't stop it from changing. You can't get outside of this experience that's always changing. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, you look, is there anything that's not changing? Is there anything that stays the same all the time? Is there anything that I can relax into? You know, is there anything that I can trust? Is there anything that I can uh, enjoy? Because everything is changing all the time. It seems as though, unless I can find some way of settling down, some way of finding some stillness, some way of finding something that's not dying, that's not changing, it seems like unless that's the case, the only option I have is not to think about it, you know, to avoid it, to try and control what's going on, to try and be as comfortable as I can until this is over, to get through it, so to speak, to get through it. Well, these teachings tell us, yeah, the good news is there is, there is something that's not changing. There is something that doesn't move. There is something that won't die. And the interesting thing about that is that that thing, that, that which doesn't die, that, that which is not bound by time, that which doesn't change, is you. Is you. That's an interesting, really an interesting thing because the last place people will look to see if there's anything that doesn't change, the last place people will look is who they are because your human life is an outward reality, you know, everybody's looking this way. And if I can't see anything looking this way that doesn't change, uh, then it looks like life does suck and then you die. If I can't see anything this way that doesn't change, then it looks like uh, at what everybody's doing makes sense, which is to, you know, do, do as much as you can to be in control and avoid being uncomfortable and avoid suffering, avoid being hurt. But of course, that way of living is suffering, <laughs> right? If you're living a life to avoid being uncomfortable and avoid the truth, avoid your destiny, avoid time, avoid loss, you know, avoid anything that's not under your control, that is a miserable life, right? That is a life of suffering because your life is about survival instead of being happy. Your life is about control instead of being relaxed. So this possibility is an interesting possibility because the only way you can discover this possibility is to let the body relax sufficiently, let the mind calm down sufficiently, and only then when the mind is calm enough and the body's relaxed is the noise out of the way, is the, uh, is the distraction out of the way, is the thinking and the feeling and the conditioning uh, out of the way, and when it's out of the way, you see what's there. You see the, the reality of the situation. You recognize who you are. This is why meditation is so important. Yeah, because meditation is a practice of sitting still and being quiet and, and relaxing the body, letting the body relax, letting the mind calm down. And it takes time. It takes patience. It takes diligence. It takes commitment. It, it takes a conviction to the truth. Most human beings will not succeed in practicing meditation and establishing a meditation practice unless they have the teaching that helps them understand how necessary that is if you want to escape the suffering that is common for a human being. You have to understand the necessity of meditation. And this is part of what the teachings are telling us. The teachings are telling us that you're all, one of the ways they talk about this in the teaching is they say, your head's already in the tiger's mouth. Your head's already in the tiger's mouth, you know. So if you think you're going to escape reality, you're mistaken. There's no way out. Your head's already in the tiger's mouth. In other words, you're already in a situation that, and that situation is going to come to its own conclusion. That's the tiger. That's the tiger's mouth. You're in a situation that's going to come to a conclusion, 
And the question is, can you wake up soon enough that it won't matter that the tiger eats you? Can you wake up soon enough that it won't matter that the body dies? Same thing. Hmm? And the possibility that is talked about in these teachings is the possibility that you can transcend this situation that you find yourself in and experience your true nature, and your true nature is not a physical being, it is a consciousness, it's an awareness. And that true nature is free. It's always been free. Its nature is freedom. It doesn't know limitation. It's beyond dualism. Its nature is freedom, it's always free. The question is, given that that's your essence, given that that is your essence, will you at some point wake up to that truth and begin to practice paying attention so that you can experience who you really are? Not that you can become that, not that you can change who you are now and become something different, no. That you realize that that has always been who you are, that's always been the truth. And you've been conditioned and you've been indoctrinated and you've been educated and you've been uh, part of a, a herd, part of a tribe that is lost in ignorance, part of a tribe that's lost in ignorance. And you had no choice about being part of that tribe, you were born into it. Just like if you were born in Russia, you'd have a different experience of the world and of, of life and of yourself. You were born wherever you were born, and that determined your conditioning, and your family determined your conditioning. So the question is, is that all there is? Is that the end of the story? Most people think it is. And that's why when you look around at human behavior, you see most people scurrying around all the time, going from point A to point B trying to get more money, you know, trying to avoid the, what, what, anything that's negative that's going on, buying more guns, right, <laughs> to protect yourself from the ongoing threat of the world, you know, especially the world we live in now where, you know, politics is still in the cave, you know. Our leaders are leading us to our, you know, to, 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 to the end of our existence, are leading our leaders are continuing to lead us uh, through craziness with war and political unrest, right? So you've got that threat going on all the time. Then you have the, th the more immediate threat of the crazy people you live with. <laughs> and then you have the more immediate threat, the crazy mind that you have, right? And then you have a more immediate threat, you know, the traffic of life that you move around in all day, right? So it's understandable that if you think that the reality that most people consider to be the truth, consider to be reality, it's understandable that people behave the way they are behaving. It's, it's understandable that their life is about avoiding things or controlling things or resisting things or fighting against things or struggling against things or coping with life and so forth. And that's a very stressful activity, you know? So it wears the body out, it tires the mind out, as you get older, you get tired. You know, it seems like uh, everything you've tried hasn't really worked out. It doesn't seem like there's gonna be any way to control the way this thing works and the way this thing goes. And so by midlife, most people get to a place where they're just in resignation. They just resign. You know, we're making the best of it, we're making the best of it. I remember talking to uh, my mother about this, you know, trying to wake her up a little bit, you know, you know, get her to kind of look at the possibility of being happy anyway. <laughs> and she thought I was crazy. She said, what are you talking about? What are you, you know, what are you talking about? You know, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see the truth. You'll see there's no, it's no use, you know. That's how most people are talking about life, you know. There is a minimal possibility for a typical human being to experience enough gratification, you know, and enough, uh, enough what they could call quote unquote happiness is really not happiness, it's gratification or it's pleasure, right? There's enough of that available even in the condition that we live in that it's, it's, it, it fools people into believing that if they do it hard enough or long enough or, or they, make, you know, they keep making the right choices and they, they do it more different or better and they do it harder, more different or better, eventually they're gonna get somewhere where this thing is gonna work consistently, you know? 
That's what happens when people uh, fall in love, you know. When you fall in love, it's a, her it's a her hormonal thing. It's a DNA thing. You don't have any choice about it, you know. And when you fall in love, you don't want to lose that. You know, you want to keep that going, right? So let's get married. That'll keep it going, you know. Let's get married. That'll help me feel more secure and relaxed so I don't have to be afraid that you're going to leave me, right? Well, as I said in my last talk, look at how that worked out, you know. It doesn't work. It doesn't, the evidence is there. It doesn't work. And yet, when you look at young people, they ignore that evidence. They ignore it, right? So th what this is about is, is, is not as, remember, the key here is not freedom for you, it's freedom from you. From you, the you that thinks making better choices is the way to have your life work. Well, it's not to say that you can't make better choices. That's obviously the case, right? But your ability to be awake enough and see things clearly enough for that to be an answer doesn't work. You can't stay awake enough and, and, and present enough to do that and have it work because your ability to pay attention is so limited. Yeah. So the answer here is to realize that, wait a minute, maybe I'm not the personality. Maybe there is an awareness here that if I can stop identifying with that personality and that thought process and those emotions and the conditioning that's been running my existence, if I can stop identifying with that and gradually let go of that and allow myself to experience the truth, which is I am this awareness itself, Upon experiencing this awareness itself, everything I've ever wanted is immediately true. Not through a process of making better choices. Immediately true. I experience, when I experience my true nature, I experience that I am happy. Why? No reason. Just the experience of being alive and existence. The experience of existing is fulfilling, you know? A baby knows that, and then the baby learns to be measurable, right? So this is a way of coming out of that misery, understanding that you can return to the innocence of the baby, right, but not really a baby because you're much more sophisticated than the baby because you know how to be in the game of life. You know how to operate in the world with the innocence of a baby, with the ability the baby has to enjoy the experience of being alive. So it's kind of a rebirth, right? It's kind of a rebirth, but it's not the same as the original birth. It's a rebirth, but it's a rebirth in which you now can really enjoy your existence because now you understand that there's a world, you understand there's other people, you know that there's something happening here to participate in, and you can do it in abandonment, you can do it full out, you can do it relaxed, you can do it enjoying yourself, Right? Because you accept everything as it is. And when I say you accept everything as it is, I'm not talking about you like a person, right? No. I'm saying the awareness doesn't have the ability to resist or reject. Just look at your, you can, you can see it right now. If you just look at your awareness, your awareness is not rejecting or resisting anything. It's just there. And it's always like that. Just there. And when you experience that that's you, then there's nothing that can happen in life that's a problem for you. Because you've accepted life, all of life, you've accepted all of life at one time, and that's it. So now when life, when life is good, you enjoy it. When life is bad, you enjoy it. Why would you enjoy when life is bad? Because you're here to experience it, that's why. What, you know, the alternative would be no life, right? So what do you want? You, you, do you want to, you, which, which life do you want? Do you want a life that is full of surprises, is an adventure, right? Unpredictable. You, you, you notice the context of it is different the way I'm talking about it right now? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's like Helen Keller said, life is either a daring adventure or nothing. She would know, right? So instead of looking at life through the lens like, oh, this is terrible, how do I get out of this? You know, how do I escape from this? How do I protect myself from this? When you wake up and you realize that the truth is, as it said in The Course of Miracles, right, what is real cannot be threatened. When you're experiencing yourself as that reality that cannot be threatened, now life is an interesting, exciting adventure. And I don't mind what happens. It's all part of the drama. It's all part of being alive. And I'm not surprised at anything. I don't expect life to be different than it is. I never do. And if, you're, if, you're never, if, you, if your expectations are always 
uh, clear, if your expectations are always wise, if, if your expectations are always workable, and the only expectation that's workable is to expect everything to be the way it is, isn't it? That's the only workable expectation. And most people are suffering a lot and upset a lot of the time because the what they expect is not the way it is. Isn't that true? Yeah, every Christmas. <laughs> right? Every Christmas, every wedding anniversary, <laughs> every birthday, right? That's what happens all the time because you, the way the brain works and the way the mind works, right, is it's constantly making comparisons, right? Is this as good as it was? Is this sex as good as that sex? You know, is this birthday as good as that birthday? Is this Christmas as good as last Christmas, right? So it's a constant comparison operation, right? And so there's these expectations, and the definition of expectation, right? The definition of upset is an unfulfilled expectation, isn't it? Anytime you're upset, if you look, you'll see that one of two things is present whenever you're upset, either an unfulfilled expectation or a thwarted intention. An unfulfilled expectation or a thwarted intention. In other words, I, I, I think it should be this way and it's not. That's an expectation that's unfulfilled and now I'm upset. I woke up this morning, I was looking forward to going out and having a good hike in the woods and it was raining and it was cold and it was windy and I'm upset because it's not the way I wanted it to be. You can take that and run with it and see it's happening all over the place in life, right? Thwarted intention, right? right? You had an intention that the woman that you were dating and you were in love with and had the hot sex with would surely want to marry you. And then so you get an engagement ring and get down on your knees and she's shocked that you're doing that because she has no intention of marrying you. <laughs> That's an unfulfilled expectation and a thwarted intention. At the same time, it's a double barrel upset. So when you wake up, you, 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 when you wake up, you, you're in a position to recognize this. You, you're in a position to see your mind instead of be your mind. And if you see your mind, you can watch the thought process generating expectations, generating intentions, right? Generating what it's generating, which is all based on past experience. And like one of my teachers said, if the thought process is all based on past experience, which it is, it's using the database of your memory to get content, and then it creates thoughts, right? So all your thoughts are, are past-oriented, right? If that's the case, right, you have no future. Check it out. If your thinking is based on the past, right, so that means that your behavior is based on the past because you do what you think to do, don't you? And if your emotions are based on past experience, which they are, then the way you feel and the way you think, which causes the way you behave, is based on the past. So you have no future. <laughs> Your past is in the future, right? Because the way you're living now and going forward is coming from the past all the time, right? That's why people are stuck in, in repeated patterns. They call them vasanas in the, in the teaching, vasanas, impressions that have occurred in the mind and in the brain, right? And everything that happens in life is triggering a process in which you are reminded of something that happened in the past. And when that gets triggered, what happened in the past comes, gets pulled up to play again. It gets pulled up to play again because if you're still here, it must have worked in the past for your survival. So the, the operation is that it pulls it up to play again with the idea that it will allow you to survive. So it's a, a survival operation. See, this is, the, this is what happens. When you wake up and you're experiencing your true nature, and that, if that becomes your identity, right, you're now a light in the darkness. It's your nature now to support life. It's your nature now to see what's not working and do whatever you can to deal with that, like the Dalai Lama is doing, right? It's your nature to do that. But at the same time, it's your nature to do that. It's also your nature to accept the inevitable reality. The world will end. The sun will burn out. It may be a longer picture than we're dealing with in terms of the lifespan that we have on Earth, right? So to deal with reality means to accept the inevitable, right? That everything that comes will go, including the Earth, including the sun, including the universe. To accept the inevitable, right? And then in the current circumstances that you have, you're expressing what the experience of life 
is like a possibility so that you feel compassion for those who are suffering and you feel for, and, and you are, feel a need to address whatever the circumstances are in whatever way you can to have those circumstances reflect the truth. That's what you're doing. You're, you, to have those circumstances reflect the truth. What's the, what's the truth? That all of us have, a, have an opportunity here during the time that this body is breathing to experience a miracle. That's the truth. All of us have an opportunity here during this short visit, sh this temporary affair, as my Zen teacher calls it, right, to experience a miracle. But if you tell that to almost everybody that you're experiencing a miracle right now, go out there and try it. <laughs> They'll say, get the hell away from me, see? Because they're so certain that this is not only not a miracle, this is a goddamn mess. And I'm gonna do everything I can to try and control how much of the mess gets on me, right? That's how people are living, it's a survival operation. So that's why you can have in the middle of people who are running around trying to be in control, running around trying to avoid the truth, running around trying to get as much as they can, you know? That if, if, if you look at people that are doing that and then you have people among them that are just peaceful and happy and enjoying the experience, they appear to be crazy. <laughs> they appear to be crazy. Yeah. You are sitting here meditating, you know, to most of the people who are here today, you appear to be a little questionable about what the hell you're doing, right? What are these people, they're, they're just sitting there, you know? You're, we're all conditioned to believe doing is what matters, isn't it? Doing. Take action, man. You know, just do it, like Mikey said, right? That's the way to live. That's the way to be in this world, you know? Fight it. Don't let it get you. Fight it. Struggle it. Don't let time get you, right? So somebody who's just sitting here and being quiet, to somebody who sees everything that way, you're a mystery. Like, these, these people are scary. We have to be careful with them. That might be a cult. That's what it is. It might be a cult. So that's what we're dealing with here, and it's up to each individual uh, to be really to experience grat being gratified and uh, and appreciate the fact. You know, Muji, one of the teachers that I've studied, right? One of the things he prescribes to people is if you're in the middle of a life that's miserable and you're suffering a lot, right? Try this. Put your hands like this right? And start walking around in your house just saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you might stumble into the reality of what there is to appreciate. It might occur to you that the fact that you can say thank you is worthy of your appreciation. Hmm? That's what I mean when I say that uh, people go through life ignoring the miracle that life is. Most people are doing that, aren't they? They're not paying attention to experiencing a miracle. They're paying attention to getting through the day. <laughs> so that's what you don't want to do. You want to come out of that sickness. That's a sick state, you know. That's, that's a sick condition in which you're unable to be happy because you don't know who you are and you don't know what's real. And that's what the practice of meditation offers and that's what these, te these teachings offer. It's all offering us the opportunity to wake up, be alive, be happy, satisfied, peaceful, and appreciate life. What do you want? What more do you want? And it's free. It's free. You already have it. You already have it. One of the teachers talked about this. She wrote a book called, um, what did she, something like a, the, a, the Miracle in Your Pocket or something like that, you know, that, that you already have everything you need to experience everything that's possible in this life as a human being. Check it out. You already have everything you need to experience what's possible in this life as a human being. You already have it. What, well, what is it that you have? Awareness. Aware of what? Everything. That's an incredible experience if you, under, if you recognize it. If you don't recognize it, well, you know how that goes. Watch the news.